Welcome to Histoire en série en VO, a podcast created by Nicolas Charles and Johan Chanoir in collaboration with Claire Schiano. In this podcast, senior and young scholars look at all the TV shows, past, present and future, to dissect your favorite series content. Histoire en série en VO, a podcast that connects series to history and humanities. Today we're going to talk about the series Leila with Paul Verhey. Paul is a senior lecturer in British literature at Bordeaux University. His research focuses on various topics such as contemporary British authors, but also Indian literature and cinema. Paul also co-founded a research group dedicated to England diaspora. Hello Paul and uh, welcome to Histoire en série en VO. So to start with, can you tell us more about this show. So when does it take place and what is it about? Uh, thank you very much, Claire. Um, thank you for inviting me uh, for this podcast presentation of these fantastic Indian series. Um, yes, Leila is a dystopian uh, show. It's a dystopian series, which is an which is adapted from a novel um, of uh, the same name, Leila, which is a recent novel. So very briefly, it's set in 2047, which happens to be exactly 100 years after Indian independence. It's set in a kind of post-apocalyptic um, dystopian world where Um, India, as we know it, as a uh, democratic state, has uh, collapsed, apparently, uh, after a series of uh, uh, man-made uh, natural disasters, and has been replaced by this religious, ethnic, fascist uh, regime, uh, which is totally devoted and uh, led by the figure of uh, Joshi, Mr. Joshi, who's a, a kind of a big brother. Um, there's a whole personality cult around him. And now society, uh, democratic society, has been replaced by um, different forms of social, ethnic apartheid. Um, society is now divided into different groups, different hierarchized groups, which are extremely, uh, which remind us very much of um, castes, of uh, traditional Indian castes, and they're numbered from one to five. And on top of that, there's a, a caste of uh, um, excluded people called douche. They're outside castes and their social apartheid is and it's uh, very striking in uh, in the series um is made obvious made visible by its uh, topographical um allocation um people are allotted a space and uh, um those different areas are divided by high walls and on top of that there's also an ecological environmental crisis Um, the air and, and water are in that place are uh, totally polluted. Water and air have become uh, precious, extremely precious goods. So the haves and the have-nots are those who can enjoy the freedom of uh, clean air, breathing clean air and drinking clean water. And those outside, well, are literally excluded. So not only are they excluded, but they are exploited. So... Um, this is the gist of story. Then when it comes to identifying characters, it's uh, centered around uh, the figure uh, of a widow, Shalini. Uh, Shalini is a, is, a, is a widow, she's a Hindu, and her husband uh, was Muslim. And that in this new world, new, uh, what we recognize as India, is uh, totally taboo, totally forbidden, totally transgressive. 
Um, so briefly, this is what you can say about the, uh, um, the general outlook of the series. Um, the plot is centered around her quest for her daughter, Layla, who's been abducted. We see that in the opening sequence of uh, the first episode. She's been uh, abducted by some uh, mysterious uh, men, um, henchmen from uh, some uh, mysterious dark... Uh, we, we, we discover they work for a kind of very dark uh, conspiracy. They've abducted her. So we start the story with Shalini, who's... Uh, um, a very was being excluded from her, um, her family, from her in-laws, because she married a, a, um, a Muslim. And so um, we follow her misadventures uh, in the different episodes. So that's what we could say as a form of uh, introduction and uh, um, setting. Um, thank you very much. And uh, what about the producer of this TV show? Uh, so, one of the um, interesting features of this um, series, first, it's, um, maybe I'll talk about it a bit later, it's a novel, and also uh, it's co-produced, and the first two episodes are directed by a very famous Indian-Canadian uh, filmmaker, director, Deepa Mehta. And this is certainly, um, this presence certainly gives uh, the series its um, aesthetics and also uh, its uh, most important theme, uh, that it's seen through the point of view um, of a woman. Uh, so very briefly, Deepa Mehta is uh, one of the most, uh, certainly one of the most representative um, transnational diasporic, diasporic um, filmmakers. She's mostly famous uh, for her trilogy called The Elements Trilogy, uh, which she made in the 90s and um, 2000s. Fire, 1996. Earth, 1998. And Water, in 2005. And we see the same... Um, the same themes as in the series, centered around um, a woman uh, who commits or witnesses some kind of social, ethnic, or religious transgression. Um, and she is a very uh, marginalized um, figure. And at the same time, there, there's a lot of uh, um, violence done um, against her. She's uh, literally persecuted, tortured, or even... Um, killed or, or threatened. So we see this uh, uh, particular touch. And the other uh, also extremely recognizable feature uh, that makes us say this is deeper meta, uh, this is a deeper meta film or deeper meta series, um, is the great attention um, to the photography. Um, the way each shot is framed, um, the colors, the choice of um, the, uh, the colors are symbolic and very important in, in the episodes. Um, the use she made when she directs the acting of, um, um, of the different characters, the different actors. Um, so everything says it's a deeper meta um, production. So she was very much involved herself as a co-producer. She was very much involved in the show because uh, we can see, as probably you, you can um, guess from what we said in the introduction, um, that it's not just a very aesthetic uh, show. It's a, a feminist uh, political series as well. Uh, because since it's a dystopia, very recognizably, this dystopia, almost by definition, I would say, is about the present. It's set in this uh, future, but there are almost everything conspires to, um, to interpret it as uh, contemporary India, uh, especially uh, this rise of um, 
this um, um, nationalist um, uh, party which is now in power. So it's very much a fable or a parable about present day India. Okay, so you also said that this show is an ad adaptation. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, it's a well. To, to be very honest, I hadn't. Um, I, I, I hadn't when I first saw uh, the series. Um, well, for, first it was uh, very good when I saw it. I think it was twenty eighteen or twenty nineteen. But I, it didn't click with uh, the fact that it was adapted fr from a novel. So when I prepared for this uh, podcast, I, um, well, looked into it and uh, realized that it was actually from a novel and um, um, a very good, very brilliant uh, novel. So a few words about uh, the novel. It's a very recent, it's tw uh, published in 2017 by a journalist, an Indian journalist, uh, Prayad, Prayag Akbar. Um, and uh, he has a, um, he's half Hindu, well, half, his, he, he was born from a Hindu Muslim, a, in a Hindu Muslim um, household. So he's uh, personally extremely sensitive to these uh, problematics of uh, uh, ethnic and religious apartheid. Now, um, the writing itself is extremely um, meditative. It's a very introspective first person narrative. Um, Deeper Meta and, the, um, and uh, those who wrote the scripts of the series um, departed quite um, obviously from, from the novel itself. Um, but uh, to, to, to put it in a nutshell, it's, uh, it's a very beautiful, very, I would say, melancholic um, novel. And uh, because, well, it, there's, no, there's very little hope. There, there's no hope in, in, in very little hope to speak of in, in, in the series, in the actual TV series. But in, in the novel, it's even bleaker, even darker. Uh, the novel itself was uh, praised by contemporary authors such as Camilla Shamsi. Um, so it's part of that, uh, you, you could say, new wave of um, postmodern dystopian um, South Asian fiction. Uh, I would compare it uh, with other Pakistani novels uh, by Mohsen Hamid, perhaps, um, is the most famous, Exit West, that sort of uh, parable. So um, that's, for, um, that's it for, for the novel, to, to put it in a nutshell, both very poetic, very sad, and very political, making a very political statement with extremely poetic means. Um, yes, of course, the, the story is, is a, a really uh, dark and sad story about um, a mother looking for her daughter in a very chaotic um, society. And what's the difference with other type of dystopian fiction? Um, well, of course, the other uh, dystopian fiction that comes to mind was at, at the time, obviously, The Handmaid's Tale because uh, the series coincided with uh, one of the seasons of The, um, of the Handmaid's Tale. Um, well, they're, they're both quite similar and at the same time there, there, there are differences. Um, as far as I remember, Atwood's um, Handmaid's Tale was written as a cautionary tale about uh, the 1980s and the rise of uh, Puritanism, uh, religious obscurantism in 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 America, in North America and in the states in particular, um, the novel and the the uh, the show, uh, Leila try to embrace. I would say it, the um, the center, the, the the hub is really about this uh, uh, political divide, the rise of nationalism, the collapse of democracy and the rule of law, but it also includes. Um, more, I would say, transnational uh, issues, such as the impact of uh, pollution on the environment, um, 
the uh, the future walls for for clean air and water. So I would say it's a uh, uh, more global, and it really articulates uh, a very um, pessimistic vision of local politics and connects them perhaps a bit more than The Handmaid's Tale and connects them a bit more with, uh, I would say, more um, global um, issues and global anxieties. So you, to, to put it in a nutshell, we have the same vibes, if you like, the same dark vibes, but uh, um, both more local and at the same time something definitely transnational, something that an audience, an international audience could uh, identify with. Um, also, maybe the difference is that um, this story, Leila, is centered around the Indian political uh, context. Yes, absolutely. And at the same time, this, um, uh, funnily enough, yes, this Indian political context is also, um, I would say, connected with um, a global rise of um, far-right identity politics in other democracies, democracies like uh, um, Brazil, um, Hungary, Poland, and of course, um, when Donald Trump was president of the United States. So, um, and specifically, what has been identified by uh, political scientists or specialists of uh, political science is something called the rise of ethnic democracy. To, so to put it briefly, ethnic democracy um, is simply in a democratic society with a um, functioning, uh, a functioning democracy with uh, elections, uh, judicial system and everything. Um, and that seems to be a um, working representative system of elections. Um, there's a global shift um, of uh, power and, and violence as well um, into the hands of one majority group. And in the case of India, it's the, um, um, the Hindus. And so to, to put it briefly, for all sorts of reasons, um, there's always been a fear by the, uh, the vast Hindu majority of being overwhelmed or of being conquered um, by those uh, they, they consider as their radical others, Muslims, uh, as they consider uh, Islam, uh, I mean, radical um, Hindus, uh, consider Islam as uh, being too radically different, as, as being radically foreign, as a foreign body in Indian culture, as opposed to all the other uh, ethnic groups or religious or religions that uh, became part of Indian um, society, Indian culture, like uh, uh, the, the Christian community, uh, the Jain, the Buddhists, uh, all these were, uh, well, became parts of the um, Indian uh, melting pot. But for Hindus and for certain parts of uh, the Hindu uh, right, Muslims are really uh, historically and politically the enemies of India. So there's this double shift, if you like. First, there's a physical identification of religion with um, the soil, with India itself, with um, national identity. Uh, so there's this um, confusion between uh, being born in India and being part of um, a whole lineage of, uh, of a whole ancestry of uh, Hindus. And at the same time, there's this both fear and uh, fascination for uh, Muslims who are seen as, as the uh, inside enemies for historical reasons. Um, so in 1947, perhaps, um, as, as you know, partition took place, the partition of the Indian subcontinent, which was the former British Empire. Uh, and... Uh, that British Empire of India was split in two. Um, India, the Republic of India, and, um, the, and the border was created and uh, a Muslim nation and a Muslim state was created, which was Pakistan. 
and ever since 1947. So there was both a partition, a very bloody partition with uh, uh, massacres, a uh, huge transfer of population, which was a huge trauma in both uh, Indian and Pakistani history. And ever since, Muslims are considered as being, um, if you like, spies or foreign agents, Pakistani agents. And so, um, for the last 60, 70 years, gradually, what was um, ideologically accepted, the Gandhian then um, Nehru's ideal of a secular India, secular in Indian term, uh, meaning that every religion is protected, equally respected. That ideal, that the state, politics, um, national identity are above um, ethnic and religious representation and um, belonging. This gradually was erased and replaced by a, a, another tendency, another national nationalistic definition of Indian identity, which had been brewing, if you like, since the 19th century. And that uh, identity, as I said, centers on this confusion of Indian identity with Hindu identity and uh, needs to have a scapegoat. They need to have a, a, an other to hate, and that other is the Muslim. So that's it very briefly, what I could say about the uh, importance of uh, politics. And so what we see in the series is this, um, uh, this, um, th this group uh, that calls now India Arya, Vahta, which means the land of the Aryans, Arya Vahta, which is, has some um, um, historical reality back in the Middle Ages. Uh, this Arya Vahta, land or abode of the Aryans, is very much reminiscent of uh, the at present BJP, the, uh, the nationalist Hindu uh, party, which is now in power in India. And of course, what we, um, we, we can recognize in the, uh, in the leaders of this party is, is, of course, all the leaders of the BJP and especially Modi, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who has a, a very strong personality cult around him. So that's the, um, the context, I would say, that uh, as a dystopia, as a political dystopia, uh, 2047 Leila is about 2020's India, and also um, about, as I said, some more um, global issues. Um, this is absolutely um, both terrific and fascinating. Um, yeah. Also, the whole story relies on a sort of classification of people based on their purity. Exactly. There's a uh, something which is uh, very much exposed, especially in the first episode, and which is central to the uh, BJP um, ideology. It's this notion of purity, and of course, it's opposite, impurity. Um, so it's connected with a kind of uh, inf inferiority complex of, um, on the part of uh, Hindus. Um, who, uh, as I said, are both a majority, but at the same time are um, terrified of being overwhelmed, uh, overrun by, by Muslims. And therefore, there's this strong identification of the body and the, the necessity to cleanse the body, both the body politics and the physical body. And so purity is very important, and, and especially in the first episode. And so... Um, and in that case, well, as always, maybe we'll say a few words about that, as is very often the case, that question of purity, purification, um, well, women are always the, uh, the victims. Women have to be purified. Women bear the brunt of all this violence and uh, all, of all this um, suspicion of being impure. Um, so this is why in the series, um, 
those who are um, considered to, to come from mixed marriages, that is simply to have married either um, someone who's not Hindu, uh, who, who've married a, a Muslim, or someone who've married outside their group from one to uh, five, outside their group, that is to say outside their caste, are considered impure and therefore have to undergo a very violent process of purification which in, um, and uh, indoctrination, which is in fact a very violent process of humiliation. Um, we see that in the first episode. Uh, those women are um, abducted and uh, they find themselves in a kind of something called a women's center and they're guarded not by not by men, and this is interesting, they're um, guarded by, obviously, they're very recognizably eunuchs, which is very important in South Asian um, culture. You find them, you find hijras, they're called hijras, uh, which means they're neither men nor women, they're trans, if you like, or sometimes eunuchs. Um, and here, they're, they're the wardens of, of these women. Uh, so, as I said, yes, hijras are very important in uh, Pakistan, in uh, Indian culture. Um, and here they're, they're, they're the guards. And these women have to undergo a regime and they have to repeat political mantras and they have to prove that they've shed their former identities and they've espoused the new ideology, the Aryavarta ideology, and they, they, they've become pure... Um, pure Aryans, and they have to undergo a series of tests, and one of them, um, so first they have to uh, repeat the, uh, the mantra, Jai uh, Aryavarta, which means long live to Aryavarta. They have to repeat that. They have to repeat their new names, their new identity. They have to uh, erase their pasts, and... Um, um, there, there are different scenes of, uh, well, physical humiliation, humiliation. They have to bathe collectively in, uh, well, dirty water to cleanse themselves from their uh, sins, from their pasts. And the, uh, the very last test is the most violent and the most cruel one. Um, they have to choose uh, one of their and they, they, one woman is picked out and has to decide on the fate of another woman. Um, she's uh, trapped in a kind of huge pyramid and they have to uh, press a, a button that um, gives out some poisonous gas to, to kill one of the other women. And uh, you have to, pre well, the women have to decide whether or not the other women live. Um, if they do that, they're supposed to overcome and be admitted uh, into well outside this uh, this place outside this women's uh, center. If they don't, um, they're punished even more. They're expelled, and they have to go some into some even more horrible place, which is uh, a labor camp, which is even outside uh, this city, uh, which is another uh, camp where they have to well uh, work and become literally slaves. And now in the story, uh, uh, Shalini refuses to uh, condemn one of the other women to death. She refuses to have her poisoned. And so she is uh, deemed unfit and she is expelled from that group of uh, women. And she has to go to a uh, labor camp. This is, and all this happens in the, uh, in the, first, uh, in the first episode. So again, yes. Um, the, uh, I would say to, to sum it up, women have to bear the brunt of uh, political violence, ethnic violence. And also this um, obsession for um, purity is controlled by technology. So there is a sort of contrast between the crude, archaic world and the technological aspect of this new society. Exactly. This is something that you um, um, often find in descriptions of uh, um, dystopias. It's something um, which is both, you, you could say, uh, a, a revival of um, um, ancient um, dogma um, about identity politics or religion. 
um, and at the same time with the help of technology and a technology to the service of um, which which is there to uh, monitor people it's more surveillance uh, and control technology so there's this very um, ancient uh, yeah archaic uh, archetypal kind of uh, violence and at the same time with those very post-human post-human uh, control technologies um, so it's this contrast which is uh, fascinating you, 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 and, and which is made um, extremely um, clear in, in, the, uh, in, in the way Deeper Meta films, um, films those women and especially films um, space and this is this very important in the, you, you have both a kind of uh, uh, almost gritty realism um, and with a, which relies on the um, importance of um, texture in the photography, texture, surface, um, also bodily fluids are represented. Uh, there are close-ups of, of the women. And at the same time, you have these uh, um, techno doodles, you, you, you could say, techno um, gadgets, um, which are even more terrifying because they are there to either control or even kill um, people. So it's this uh, great contrast, which is also um, in coherence with um, the way society is uh, divided. Those who have, those who belong to the first class have everything. They have uh, um, a grandiose uh, schemes about uh, the, the future. They have uh, uh, all sorts of uh, technological, very advanced, um, technologies to help them have better lives. And on the other side, in the slums, the douche, the, the outcasts have literally nothing. They don't even, they have to fight for water. So this contrast between a highly technological society and uh, a, a very violent social reality makes the show um, even more fascinating. Um, yes, and also, um, about the photography um, and this uh, terrific classification of people, we can see the importance of geography and topography in the series. Yes, absolutely. That's uh, something which is uh, uh, made very clear by in the um, cinema, I would say photographic choices. There's a, um, first of all, yes, society is physically divided. Uh, there's uh, and, and you see physical walls, actual walls that divide the different parts, the different groups, the different enclaves in this new society. And at the same time, in, in the first episode, which is centered on these intimate, claustrophobic um, space, you, you rarely see the women outside. They're, they're always filmed, and, and, and the hero, uh, the, the hero, the uh, yes, Shalini is always. Uh, filmed inside um, she's always um, filmed and the framing the frames are very important you always she's always shot uh, within a, a door frame or you have curtains or she's shot from a distance and you see different frames like a courtyard um, different rooms so she is always um, she, she is if you like imprisoned by her situation and and that is made even more symbolic more clear by, by the choices the uh, all those repetition of uh, frames so um, the, the way space is represented in the show uh, well really emphasizes the divisions of uh, society the idea that uh, uh, transgression is absolutely impossible and escape is um, well of course there's a the, there are twists there's a plot but apparently just at the beginning um, the, these physical borders are so important that uh, um, escape is totally impossible <clears throat> so maybe we are going to focus on the first episode Okay, so this is where we discover the whole setting of the story, the characters, but also the particular photography of the show. You mentioned it before. The photography is um, very specific, 
um, orchest uh, orchestrated in a very um, specific manner. Absolutely, yes. And um, as I said, it's uh, typically deeper meta kind of photography. It's very, made me think very much of um, um, w one of the other films you made, one the, the last of the um, Elements trilogy called Water, which he made in 2005, which is about an ashram of widows in uh, Varanasi, which is Benares. It's filmed in the same way, um, both very poetic and great attention to color. So yes, we, we have all this uh, color oppositions, color symbolism. Uh, you have the, the blue and, and, and gray hues, which are usually, and in, in the first episode, associated uh, with uh, her past, her happy past when she was married, when she was uh, socially apparently part of the first group she had a maid, which she didn't treat very well, by the way. And, uh, and the, the first uh, sequence is uh, um, extremely striking because we, it takes place in a huge swimming pool. And uh, so you have this beautiful blue color and you have uh, uh, the father and the daughter, the little girl, Leila, um, swimming in there. And they're suddenly attacked by some goons who kill the husband and take the, uh, the little girl with her. And the, uh, the water in the swimming pool becomes red. And this, and after that, every time water is shown and every time uh, the main character, Shalini, bathes in water, it's polluted water, it's dirty water. So you have this first sequence, which is a kind of, um, which almost seems retrospectively as a kind of mirage, um, a vision of uh, a paradise which is suddenly soiled, polluted by, by the, the husband's um, blood. Um, as if this was in this first scene, uh, the whole plot was, and, and the whole uh, political statement, um, the complete political statement was made. So before the, 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 there was a kind of amiotic perfection, um, purity, which is polluted by external violence, external politics. And of course, the, the harmony between the, uh, uh, the religious groups is also, uh, well, done with, is also um, abolished. So you have these blue colors, which are opposed to the maroon, red maroon robes that these uh, widows, these women um, have to wear uh, as a kind of uniform. And it makes them uh, become totally identical in this very drab, brown, rundown environment. And so you have this uh, um, contrast uh, between the done drab colors of, of the present, uh, as if everything had been devoid of life, contrasted with uh, the, the clear, um, clear uh, colors of the past. And of course, uh, in that first episode, elements uh, like water are, are extremely important. Uh, that water cleansing, um, bathing are very important, but uh, in the present for Shalini in her um, uh, women's um, hostel or uh, center where she is with the other women, uh, water does not clean her anymore. Water is uh, uh, dirty. And so instead of cleansing, it, it pollutes her. Um, also, what is interesting is, is the way in the first episode uh, the women are presented as a group uh, almost totally devoid of solidarity. On the contrary, they're almost at every turn on, on, on the point of denouncing each other or hurting each other. So um, there's a, a fairly little connection between the women. Um, what else? Well, yes, um, that... And yep. also they're very violent. Yes, there's uh, always uh, lots of uh, uh, physical and verbal abuse. So 
violence is uh, everywhere and uh, so to speak violence is internalized by these women and they commit uh, violence um, to other women. Um, well, yeah, that's basically what I could say about the first uh, first episode. And yes, in the end, there's a in the end of that episode, there's a slight twist because, as I said, Shalini is punished. She's expelled from the center, and she's uh, sent to a labor camp where she'll be with uh, uh, the uh, as a slave. And there's an accident on the way. The van where she is um, has a well has a crashes into uh, a barricade and she can escape and she uh, runs among uh, the group of douche which is the the outcasts uh, they in the slums and so perhaps in the uh, next episode there's a little more hope yeah um also what are the different themes um in the first episode with we for instance have the sort of a uh, biopolitical reading of present day India. Yes, that's uh, something that uh, um, came to mind, a, a form of political, um, I would say, thought, which is extremely popular at, now, uh, I would say, in uh, uh, Indian fiction, Indian cinema, uh, and which is also connected with a post-colonial vision of society or a decolonial vision of politics. It's um, um, something taken, concepts, this concept of biopolitics briefly is taken from Giorgio Agamben's writings, an Italian philosopher uh, who writes a lot about these, uh, um, about state violence. Um, so very briefly and which I think is something very interesting uh, a kind of uh, frame of interpretation we could use. Uh, Agamben makes a difference um, in present societies which he says have embraced now something called a state of exception that is a state of permanent violence and apartheid a state of exception uh, that is that when the state now uses an illegitimate use of violence. Uh, he says it emphasizes the difference between zoe, which is a Greek word for life, and another Greek word, bios. Zoe is what he calls pure life, existence, if you like. And bios, bios is the more complex social political life. So it's the difference be between being simply a human being um, and um, bios, if you like, someone who has uh, rights, political rights and who can exercise these rights and is, uh, can connect with society. And very briefly, Agamben says that uh, now some people are excluded from bias and <clears throat> um, have to remain, have to remain and, and only have their Zoe, their what he calls bare life. And when someone has only bare life, only Zoe, they can be disposed of. And we have that, and they can be excluded from the um, collective group and become slaves or be sacrificed uh, for religious or political reasons. And it's exactly what we have. And for Agamben, and also what we have in the first and, and the, the, um, all the other episodes, it is representation of society as uh, topographical enclaves. Uh, you stay where you belong and people are excluded and have to live in camps. And so this is very clear. So for Agamben, he thinks of migrants. Um, he also had in mind when he was writing in the 1990s, or of course, what he had in mind very strongly was the, uh, the, the Nazi concentration camps, which for him embody really 20th century politics. And so we have here the, the same thing, this idea of enclaves, walls, uh, physical demarcation, well, uh, w where the people um, who are disposable can be uh, placed and are not allowed to um, uh, change, not allowed to move. And the state uh, here represented uh, with this ideology, this Aryavarta, 
Hin, Hin, um, Hindu ideology is really imposing this state of exception, uh, both illegitimate violence and also very strong demarcation. Um, so yes, it's um, and I'm, I'm, I'm certain also um, that there's a, um, um, prior Akbar had also that in mind, had also Agamben or Foucault in mind, uh, because this is very much about uh, this uh, biopolitical reading of Indian politics. <clears throat> and can we make a geocritical reading of Leila? Um, yes, that's the other very tempting, um, tempting uh, grid of interpretation, uh, which Bertrand uh, Westphal, to put it briefly, is one of the uh, a very important um, critic uh, in space, ge ge new geography, and something called geocriticism, that is the importance of the representation of space and topography in literature and in general in fiction. Uh, yes, we do have a, a very uh, literary, symbolic uh, representation of, um, of, of space. And it also plays with the interplay or with a tension between what is made familiar and made unfamiliar. This is typical, uh, a very geocritical approach. That is, we both in the series, for example, and the same thing in the novel, we're both um, see this familiar and unfamiliar India at the same time, because it's, a, it's not present day, but at the same time we see um, details, we see a whole narrative that makes us say it is India, or it's an India that might be. So, um, and, and, and yes, space, the different spaces, as I said, are both important in terms of politics, but also in terms of poetics as well, because the only um, time that Cellini can escape is through these flashbacks, for example, when she remembers the beginning, um, the, the incident, or also um, about the, uh, when she daydreams about her, her dead husband. So it makes, uh, if you like, the present um, sometimes ambivalent, or the, the, the uh, physical borders are impossible to cross, but the borders of imagination, poetic borders can be crossed. And this is why there's the, the appearance of the, the dead husband. She has conversations with uh, the, the dead husband and we don't have any signs, clear signs in the narrative, if you like, uh, that she is dreaming, that she is imagining uh, something. So perhaps the only uh, place uh, of freedom that she has in this, uh, um, yes, this geography of the mind, this geography of dreams. Um, and so maybe uh, Westphal, as well as Agamben, help us understand that dystopian fiction, such as Leila, helps us understand the present because it both, I would say, uh, narrates and un-narrates the present or as Westphal would say, it's, it maps and unmaps and remaps uh, the present and what we recognize. And so uh, in order to make us understand the horror of some violence, the horror of politics, it's both made unfamiliar to be um, eventually uh, re-familiarized for the uh, audience. And this is, I would say, uh, we which I find fascinating about Leila. It's this constant uh, unmapping, remapping of, in, of, uh, of India and the uh, Indian subcontinent. Um, also, Leila is um, sort of part of a trend um, in a Jara Indian series. Um, yes, that, 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 that's what I also... Uh, which seems to be very fascinating when, when you look up uh, through the Netflix catalogue. Um, there's a definite tendency in very later series to, to use genre, to, like 
this one political science fiction or dystopian uh, cinema. Also, I was thinking about an absolutely fascinating uh, series called Ghoul, which is about the same thing. It's set in a dystopian, uh, dystopian future where Muslims uh, have become some kind of, uh, uh, well, uh, radical enemies. It's become a military state. And, and Ghouls, uh, as the name suggests, is, is about, uh, well, there's a, a, uh, it's about possession. It's about uh, that there's a kind of vampire that, that comes back to enact uh, um, a kind of uh, vengeance. So Ghoul is a very good example. I hope to speak about Ghoul in some future podcast. Also, uh, Daily Crime uh, is an attempt, is a very successful attempt at uh, uh, making a kind of true crime um, series, uh, a very gritty noir series about something that actually uh, took place in, in Delhi in 2007, uh, the horrific rape, torture and murder um, of, a, um, of an Indian student. Um, and so, yes, there, there's this definite tendency <clears throat> um, to use uh, genre tradition, genre fiction, uh, explore that, um, and explore those tropes, uh, to write metaphors, um, parables about um, present, um, present violence, present political violence in, in India, and the, I would say also yeah, include Pakistan. Uh, because it's basically the same uh, same historical matrix. Uh, so this is interesting. There's uh, uh, they, they they use genre for, uh, to, to create those uh, stories and to reach uh, a global audience and to reach uh, uh, an international audience through Netflix, which I think is also a very interesting point. <clears throat> Uh, what is uh, striking in the first episode is the representation of uh, women. So they are oppressed, so both in their rights, but also in their femininity and obviously under male um, domination. So do they, do they have any type of agency in this dystopian society? This is a very good question. Um, and I think it's generally something which I find very problematic with uh, all the Netflix uh, series that you, you can see, whether it's um, Spanish noir fiction, Spanish noir, uh, Indian or, or, or British. Um, I think there's a, that there's a connection, it's about questioning the agency or lack of agency of women. And um, I don't know. I, I find it um, because I've seen so many, that, but, but I make the, the connection that beyond um, the very local uh, politics, the, 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 the very local um, historical realities of, of the place, that there's, a, I would say, a, a continuity. It's, uh, all these shows are about violence against women. Uh, and how they are considered by the male gaze, to, to put it very, uh, and how they are always um, confined to uh, the, uh, the the Zoe. They are always confined to the, the to bare lives. As I said, whether it's Indian, British, or Spanish series, you, you see the same thing. It's about either prostitutes or uh, drug addicts, um, and here in that case, they're widows, but they're socially uh, proscribed characters, marginalized characters, and they, they, they meet a lot of violence, a uh, lot of male violence. And this I find, and it really questions the, the, the agency of women. It does. We, we are very much in a post Me Too um, or a Me Too society where violence against women is, well, now made very plain and obviously now more and more considered and condemned. But at the same time, in all those shows, and probably because those Indian series are very um, extreme, if you like, because a lot of violence, a lot of very disturbing politics um, are, are taking place. There's a lot of state violence going on. Perhaps it's more 
prevalent, but we see that. And um, I find it very questionable, very disturbing that uh, uh, it's a common thread I find with uh, Netflix, which is both um, has this new policy of uh, creating very local, uh, very historically uh, placed shows. And at the same time, you have the same, um, the, the, the same representation. Um, and also about the, the, the little freedom they, they seem um, to have, um, it is actually an illusion because, for example, even when they pass the purity test um, mm. and they are allowed to go out of their, um, the women's centre, they have to be under the supervision of their father and, uh, or brother if they want to go out. So there is literally no... Uh, possibility of a, a female sort of empowerment in this society, I think. Yes, exactly. And uh, you, you find it, it's not Netflix, but it's this, it had the same cultural impact. Of course, the, uh, um, uh, the Handmaid's Tale, it's the, the, the same thing. Uh, you have the same paradox uh, in the Handmaid's Tale uh, with Elizabeth Moss as the central figure, creating a very strong female character. But at the same time, this agency is questioned. And here, absolutely, uh, those women remain enclaved, remain prisoner of a very patriarchal uh, patriarchal world. They're, they're not allowed any, any amount of freedom. And as you said, uh, any amount of freedom is, uh, is an illusion. Um, so it's both, I uh, find it quite... Um, I would say, again, problematic, this uh, constant repetition of uh, absence of, uh, of freedom. And again, um, violence, um, violence against women. Um, thank you very much. And maybe to, to conclude, um, what can we say about the distribution of such a show? So it is available on Netflix at France, but what about the diffusion and reception of this show elsewhere? Um, so the reception, um, the, uh, yes, that's the, 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 the fascinating thing. You, you can, um, in, in that uh, Netflix catalog, you can access any show, Turkish, Indian, uh, and same thing with um, Pakistan is they, they can access a Swedish uh, series. Uh, uh, it's, and we are, so the, the first thing I would say, we are someone else's exotic, which I think is uh, quite interesting. That's uh, what Netflix is uh, um, creating. And at the same time, there's both a kind of uniformity in, 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 in shows. You always have the same... Um, same passages, the same kind of narrative. Um, and again, um, I said what strikes me is this constant um, violence. So it's this paradox of Netflix, which both reinvents exoticism, uh, both, and again, makes, exposes perhaps local, um, local violence, because the show in India it was uh, had very, I would say, tepid reception in um, in the press from what I could read uh, for all sorts of reasons because Indian journalists don't consider Deepa Mehta as authentic enough, or perhaps they um, uh, they criticised <clears throat> that was the first criticism. It's not authentic. Deepa Mehta uh, is not an authentic. Filmmaker, and the other criticism was that um, the, the, the characters are too shallow. Uh, all, all the questions, the religious, ethnic questions, are not delved into. Are not, and um, the main criticism was that most characters are uh, too dimensional, uh, too shallow. Um, well, they rep they, so the, the main reproach that it was a too, too global was to please a global audience, which is a, a kind of very common criticism. Um, well, that's what I can say about the, uh, the reception. But it creates an awareness 
in a global audience about uh, different realities and different uh, uh, different societies, which I think is well, first fascinating. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Paul, for this fascinating uh, presentation <laughs> about Leila. Thank you, Claire. a single episode join us on twitter at histoire en série and find our guest presentation and bibliography on our website www.histoireenserie.com Such a beautiful blonde, it populates your body strangely